Hi everyone. Um, we're going to be starting our new unit on molecular biology. And so we're going to take a zoomed in look on DNA and some of the topics that we've already kind of covered. And we're just going to go more in depth with um, our understanding of genetic material. Okay. So we know now that DNA is the source of genetic material, but um, that was actually a very difficult thing for scientists to discover. It is actually a very recent discovery within the past century, um, to partly just because DNA is so small and you can't just really look at it through the microscope. So um, the first experiment that really um, made a difference in our understanding of genetic material uh, was done by a man named Griffith in 1928. So Griffith took different types of bacteria and infected mice with them. Um, now, he found that when he took a rough strain of bacteria, which is one where um, it is not dangerous to the mice, it's non-virulent and non-pathogenic, um, when he infected the mice, they clearly survived. Um, now, when he took a dangerous form of bacteria called smooth strain and infected the mice, the mice died. Um, and then when he took that same dangerous strain, the same smooth strain bacteria, and he heated it up, um, remember, when you heat up the bacteria, you're denaturing those proteins and thus killing that bacteria. So when he injected this dead bacteria into the mice, the mice survived because it was no longer dangerous because the bacteria was dead, thus allowing the mice to be alive. The interesting thing that he found was that when he mixed the, the rough strain of bacteria, that's the bacteria that is not dangerous, with the heat-killed smooth bacteria, so that's the bacteria that's that was dangerous, but it's dead. And when he mixed these two together and injected the mouse mice with this, um, the mice actually died. So what do you think you could conclude from this kind of experiment? Well, clearly there must have been some kind of transfer process between the dead bacteria to the alive bacteria. And somehow those alive bacteria suddenly changed from being non-dangerous to becoming pathogenic. So he concluded that um, that these living bacterial cells that were mixed together with the smooth, the dead smooth bacteria um, became pathogenic. And he also found that all the descendants of these transformed bacteria cells continued to be pathogenic. And so he decided that bacteria are capable of transferring um, heritable information from one to another. And this, this process is called transformation, which we'll talk about later. But the important part here is that genetic material can be passed from one cell to a totally different cell. Um, at this point, he wasn't sure what that genetic material was made of. Um, they suspected it was actually proteins because proteins has 20 amino acids. So they thought that it was complex enough for it to transfer genetic material, but they weren't sure. And so Henry and Chase um, conducted the experiment that finally decided on um, kind of decided on what, what the genetic material is made of. Um, so what they did was they take they took bacteriophages, and they kind of look like these little alien figures. Um, these bacteriophages are nice because they're very simple. They have just a protein coat on the outside, and on the inside is the DNA, right inside this little capsid head. And so it's just two materials. It's the protein on the outside and the DNA on the inside. And so Hen Hershey and Chase wanted to figure out um, whether or not it was the protein that was transferring genetic material or if it was the DNA inside. And so what they did was they labeled one batch of bacteriophages with um, radioactively labeled sulfur. Only protein has sulfur in some of the amino acids. And so they knew that the sulfur would indicate the, evident, the presence of proteins. Um, they also took a separate batch of bacteriophages and um, radioactively labeled the phosphorus. And as we know, DNA has a lot of phosphates in them. And so that would be an indicative of the DNA. And so here is a, just a diagram representing what they've done. But here they incubated the two different um, batches. This one right here is the one, um, I believe, with the sulfur. This is a sulfur one, so this is to indicate for, pro, uh, for the protein coat. And then here is the phosphate. So this is where they labeled the DNA inside. And so they allowed the bacteria phages to infect the bacteria. And then afterwards, they kind of ground up this entire mixture. And the reason why they ground it up is because anything on the outside of the bacteria would kind of like fall off and separate into a separate layer. And so this allowed them to figure out what was inside of the bacteria and what remained on the outside. 
And then they found after they tested this that um, for the, the layer with the radioactively labeled sulfur, that none of the sulfur really got inside of the bacteria, whereas the radioactively labeled phosphorus was actually found to be inside of the bacteria, um, as evidenced in being the bottom layer, the heavier layer with bacteria cells. And so they concluded from this experiment that it was phosphorus and thus DNA that was the source of genetic material. Um, right, so this is their conclusion. DNA is what the phages injected into the bacteria. And just to kind of recap on how bacteriophages replicate, you'll see that they'll land actually on top of the bacteria and the DNA material inside of their capsid head gets injected into the bacteria and then they allow the this um, kind of takes over the bacteria system and the bacteria starts to replicate viruses over and over again. And then once it's full of bacteria, um, the bacteria cell lyses and explodes and all of those bacteriophages leave the cell. Okay, as a brief overview of the structure of DNA and RNA, um, you know that these are polymers. Um, they're, called poly, uh, they're called nucleic acids or polynucleotides. And they're polymers of nucleotides. Nucleotides are the little um, units that make up all of DNA and RNA. Um, in terms of nucleotide structure, we've gone over this before, but it's made of a phosphate group, uh, a sugar group, and there's some kind of nitrogenous base. Um, for DNA, uh, deoxyribonucleic acid, it's missing a OH hydroxyl group right here. It's missing an oxygen. Whereas for RNA, this sugar has an extra OH right here. So this, this nucleotide is for um, DNA. Uh, for RNA, you would just see the same, almost the same exact thing, except for right here would be an extra OH. Um, you should know the difference or be able to recognize the four different types of nucleotides in DNA plus the extra one for RNA. So for the nitrogenous bases, the pyrimidines are just one ring and cytosine and uh, thymine for DNA are the two pyrimidines. Uh, uracil is what replaces thymine for RNA. So RNA has the same four nitrogenous bases except for one, the same, sorry, same three and the only difference is that instead of thymine, it has uracil. Um, uh, there's also purines. Purines are two carbon rings, and you have guanine and adenine are the two different types of um, purines. Here's just a schem uh, schematic drawing of DNA, and you can see the sugar phosphate background backbone here, which is made from these five carbon sugars attached to the phosphates. They kind of string together. Here is just, you can see like this is one of the nucleotides, but all of these are nucleotides that are stacked together. And here you can see the hydrogen bonds that are formed between the nitrogenous bases of the different nucleotides, which is kind of what keeps that shape together. So in terms of discovering the, the shape, the double-stranded helix shape of DNA, um, that's attributed to someone, uh, to two people named Watson and Crick. And someone named Rosalind Franklin really helped them discover it with her x-ray images of DNA. Um, they discovered that DNA is double helix, which just means it has that swirly shape where the, they kind of intertwine the two phosphate backbones. It kind of looks like a ladder that's just twisted. Um, a and T, so uh, adenine and thymine um, are the ones that always link together. And guanine and cytosine are also the ones, are the pair that link together. Adenine and thymine have two hydrogen bonds, whereas guanine and cytosine have three hydrogen bonds. Um, because this has an uh, G and C have an extra hydrogen bond, they're considered a stronger base pair, just because there's you know more reinforcement between them. So this concludes this lecture. Um, a lot of this material is review, but what is important is not just the conclusions of these experiments, but um, really understanding the process of how these scientists were able to discover what we currently know about DNA. And so that logic of kind of figuring out what they know is what I want you guys to, um, to kind of take away from this. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.